All right, party people from made to Philadelphia. I guess that's part of the skeleton. Square like thousands of unknown soldiers made the first stars and stripes flag. All right, party people, we are uh, at Gifford Pinchot State Park, just outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And uh, we got a last minute honor system uh, site here, site number 141 with electrical hookup. Got the fan blowing. Pops is swimming up some dinner. Alright, we're gonna eat. Alright, boys and girls, we're at Valley Forge in uh, King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. So, we're, at, we're gonna do the encampment tour, but there's some of the old artillery sitting out here. Probably a replica of some sort. Winter encampment. Country Strive was stripped of trees. All available wood went to build and heat the city of huts that crowded this ridge. And the Continental Army, Army wintered here. Every acre was heavily used for entrenchment, stock pens, and artillery. German family. Peter Mullenberg. Mount Misery. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad. There is a lot of land out here. City of Huts. Refuge for the winter. There's snow out there. Welcome to the fourth largest city in America. Arriving in this area in the winter of 1777, soldiers built 2,000 log huts. Dang! General Washington issued orders on the sizes and locations. Most of the task was finished within a month. For six months, the Log City's population rivaled Philadelphia, New York, and Boston. The smallest hut housed the soldiers were located at the front line. As one's rank increased, so did the size of the hut. The commissary kitchen was placed at the rear, farthest from the enlisted men. Huh. Streets ran parallel. I'm sure these are just replicas, right? How many snakes is up in this thing? Uh, how many snakes are in here? There's snakes in here. Yeah, I don't know about that. They got power out here because they got LED lights. Boy, they said that that winter was wet and muddy. You couldn't even couldn't even farm it the next year. I think they're about all the same, ain't it? Yeah, that's the only one you can go in. The rest of them are locked up. Can you imagine two thousand of these? So this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's only nine houses. Yeah, I don't know. They got every one of them has a chimney built into it too. Look at that chimney. Square yeah. basically, and it just gets smaller as you go to the top. It sure is, but you can tell how hilly it is back over there. You can see the ridge line. Yeah. Discipline and training. Large protected valley in front of you is the Grand Parade, extending from where you stand to the ridge almost a mile away. That's a mile to that ridge. It serves as the centerpiece of the camp. When units from the various states arrived, Prussian General, that's why they call this King of Prussia, Prussian General Friedrich Wimhelm de Steuben brought European discipline to the Continental Army. He trained them for the eventual campaign that would wage against the British. Imagine it's May 6, 1778, array of the Grand Parade in front of you are 10,000 Continental soldiers. They are demonstrating their new skills for General Washington. This is the gala celebration of the new military alliance with France, which has just been announced. Soldiers moving in position for inspection. That's where they did all their military exercises, right out there. All right, I think we have to drive to the next one. The Memorial Arch. I mean, you can imagine this just being a bunch of farmland back in the 1700s. It's just perfect for that as far as you can see. The trees and landscaping around the Memorial Arch are a living tribute to those who sacrificed to preserve our newly founded nation, 1777 to 1977. Well, this has been out here since 1977. Dang, that thing was built in 1912. For this arch? Yeah. Preserved in 96. 
Naked and starving as they are, we cannot enough admire the incomparable patience and fidelity of the soldiery. Washington at Valley Forge. It says, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. And then at the top it says, naked and starving as they are, we cannot enough admire the incompatible patience or incomparable patience and fidelity of the soldiery. Pretty big. Commander in Chief George Washington. That's all his generals right there. Major generals, DeKalb, Green, Lafayette, Lee, Memphis, Steuben, Sterling, Sullivan, and Newit. Septus, Novus Ordo, Seclorum. And here in this place of sacrifice is the veil of humiliation in this valley of the shadow of that death out of which the life of America rose, regenerate, and Free, let us believe with an abiding faith that to them union will seem as dear in liberty, as sweet and progress, as glorious as they were to our fathers and are to you and me, to the institutions which have made us happy, preserved by the virtue of our children, shall bless the remotest generation of the time to come. Henry Armit Brown. Wow, that was a breath right there. Look at those faces in there. It kind of looks like a Latin kind of thing. Yeah. There's a lot of Latin writing up there, it looks like. And there's the United States seal. Oh, yeah. They had to have one heck of a keystone in that arch. Right? Oh, yeah. Look up there. And you can't get on the inside of it, neither can Let's see what this memorial over here is. Is that, is that, what is this symbol? Is this like the Freemason symbol? I can't remember. Is that what that is? That retractor and the compass thing? Is that the Freemason symbol? Arch preserved by the, yeah, Freemasons of Pennsylvania. So built in 1912 and re-preserved in 1977. Remembrance of the Continental Army, led by George Washington, a member of the Masonic Fraternity, and in honor of many Freemasons who were part of the encampment at this site. The Freemasons of Pennsylvania placed this monument to the future generation that freedom was important in 1997 as it was in 1777. Everett O. Weiser, R.W. Grandmaster, Grand Lodge of the Freemasons, and something, something of Pennsylvania dedicated. It's all right there. There's this side over here. It says, To the officers and Oh, private soldiers. Yeah, they kind of run together. It says, To the officers and private soldiers of the Continental Army, December 19, 1777, June 19, 1778. Mm -hmm. On the other side of us, Chairman of the Chester County Committee, 1774. Born Chester County, Pennsylvania, 1745, died at Prescott Island. Here's guy. Anthony Wayne. That right there, folks, is an important man. That Mr. Anthony Wayne, Colonel Chester Company Battalion of Minutemen. You can see the King of Prussia cityscape over there. All right, we're going to General Washington's headquarters. Or should I say General Washington's headquarters? You know what I mean? That's his house right there. That's a picture of his headquarters. 
You know, his home was in Virginia, Mount Vernon. So I have General Washington's command post and living quarters during a winter encampment of 77 to 78. Long gone are the original industrial village and the wooden huts and the fortifications that define the camp. Since late in the 19th century, the memory of outer forts has been kept alive through recreation, through creation of a primitive park setting and preservation of key structures. Hmm. Yeah, not really anything left, but that's a that's like a really good uh, just 20 miles outside of Philadelphia Valley Forge, close enough to modern British Army activities, but far enough away to permit a surprise attack. Attack. Washington used the hilly country to his advantage, building defensive lines on the ridges overlooking Philadelphia to the east, and nesting the camp against the Schuylkill River to prevent attack from the north. They cut the top out of that tree, didn't they? Did you know who owned and lived in the building when Washington arrived? The house was built for Isaac Potts, an iron master who was one of the owners of the Valley Forge. At the time of the winter encampment, he was not living there, but had run into his aunt, Deborah Hughes. Wow, there's a photo from 1880. Eighteen sixty one. This is the earliest known photograph of Washington's headquarters taken when it was still a private residence. Just upstream in the site of Valley Forge, which this area was named, the Continental Army used the force to store food. That was three months before the winter encampment. The British swept through on September eighteenth, seventeen seventy seven, burned the forge and other buildings. Much needed supplies were lost. The British fired some parting shots at the fleeing rebels, killing one man. This small skirmish would only be only fighting to take place, only fighting to take place at <laughs> Valley Forge. When the forge was excavated by archaeologists in the 1920s, charred timbers from the arson lay among the cannonballs. Wow. This is headquarters, huh? Yep. Can't get inside. It's closed. Huh. huh? Ain't that some stuff? Is it closed? Yeah. Still enclosed. All right, there's Pops at Valley Forge. This is uh, George Washington's, General George Washington's headquarters. All right. Mr. Washington? What is it? George Washington, Virginia. Huh? Some kind of lock box. Look at that old lock right there. Got a cellar back here. They got sandbags back here. It must get pretty wet. All right, keep it from sucking in there. Man, those. How many floors is that? Three or two. Look at those hooks. Three and a half. It looked like, yeah, it looks like two and a half. It looks like kind of like a split level or something. That window there is either on the ground or in between. It's kind of. Can you figure it out? Yeah, they must have did an add-on or something, and it might be a might be a stairway through that window there. It could be. Can't get inside. Was this the garage? Or is this the horses. carriage house? Yeah, it's got an upstairs. Uh, kind of like a pat. Yeah, it's got a. Definitely got a carriage house doors on it, not horses. Let's go read this thing and see what it is. So they say instead of carrying his uh, his sword, instead of holding his sword, it's actually just a walking stick. That's his guards right there. I bet the soldiers and all them stayed in there. Yeah, that's the guards. That's his security force right there. Baron von Steuben. You had to be five foot eight to five foot ten to be a guard. Oh yeah. Yeah, you couldn't be no shorty. They cut a man piece of wood to do that right there. You know that? Mm -hmm. I love those way those pieces were made. All right, pops, where are we at? Hers? Yeah, we're at the Hershey Chocolate Factory. There's the roller coaster over there. 
part of the uh, actual uh, theme park. We're just going to go in for the chocolate tour, and then we're going to head over to an antique car museum. Beans are separated and fermented. Bean looks like when it hardens. It kind of looks uh, similar to a coffee bean almost. Yeah. After they ferment them, they put them in those uh, sacks. It's like coffee sacks, basically. You can also grow almonds for their, uh, you know, the, the almond bar. They come from California. Add vanilla to the chocolate to make it taste like it does. So this is the milk coming from the, uh, from the farms that they put in the milk chocolate. They use fresh milk so straight from the farm. Nineteen oh three Milton Hershey created that very first chocolate factory in the middle of a, a dairy farm area. Be inside the vehicle at all times. We're on our way to the Hershey Chocolate Factory. It all starts with cocoa beans, which are harvested and shipped to us from tropical regions around the world. Grinding turns cocoa beans into the smooth, dark liquid used to make milk and dark chocolate. Pressing also produces cocoa butter, which we'll use later on in the process. The only companies in the world that uses fresh milk to make... We pasteurize and condense the sweet milk and then blend in the... All comes together. chocolate until it reaches a smooth uniform consistency developing a rich flavor and color wow. texture and consistency during tempering we can mix in other ingredients such as roasted california almonds next we pour the milk chocolate into molds and send them on a puffy conveyor ride all of that fresh delicious chocolate special it looks like our packages are ready to go and i better get going too it well, now you know the hard work. And watch your step onto the moving platform. International. Okay. But look at the, uh, so it's a 1913 International. Look at the gear breakdown between that drive sprocket and that uh, <laughs> road sprocket there. Wow. Serious gear reduction. Look at this 59 El Camino. It's sharp. That's bigger than the truck bed today. Is that what it's called, a Willis? I think it is. Oh, I thought it was like the same as Jeep Willys. Yep. That's right here. He went like Steve there. Yeah, there's a little little quarter window on each side there. Yeah. And one big main window in the back. Yeah, 37. Yeah. You can tell by that freaking hood ornament. Look at that hood ornament. It's just like a... Uh, Huh. Maybe top. Mm -hmm. Got the spare tire on the side and everything, done. Huh? Sharp. Yeah. 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 That thing he, he's got a tank. There's a tail motor in it. 312. 272. 272. 171 horsepower. Yeah. That's my dad. Uh, that's what that crank that crank we're doing. That's that's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah I like this to color. What, what color is it? It's like a powder blue. I don't know what they call that. A light blue. 
Yeah, it's lighter than your Ford. Yeah. Your 56. Fifty-three. 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 Fifty-five. Six pedal, right? Power glide. What is? Can you tell it's automatic or not? No, it's a straight shift. Uh, it's somebody wears some more. Three, three pedals down there. Yeah. Nineteen twelve little. Who? It's a little. Oh, I don't hear that that before. It's later renamed as Chevrolet, so I guess they produced it that day. It says they produced it in Flint. William Little. Little Chevrolet and William Little. So it was, yeah, that's bare bones right there, ain't it? It's bare bones. Yeah. It's got leather belt buckles holding the top on. There's an 1896 Benton Harbor motor carriage. You didn't have a steering wheel, did it? It's got a steering stick. Where the, hell, where the heck's the engine at? Way up under there. Was it steam? Seven horsepower. Huh. Gasoline engine up under there. Well, you know that thing had to run mighty fast. Should run about two miles per hour, right? That was a 30 model A. That's that Maxton Mile right down in Fayetteville or on the airstrip. I reckon. That's what the sticker says Maxton on it. See what it says. 2004 land speed record attempts at Bonneville Salt Flats. 204 miles per hour. Dang. 4.6 liter Ford. Dual turbo charge. 30 pounds of boost. 1300 horsepower. 59 Ford. And Cherry. That's the that's the El Camino equivalent, right? The Ranchero on the forward side. 87. Look at look at this one. Tucker Tiger. Tiger design team order from left to right. Eugene Houston. Preston Tucker inventor. Dang, it had a it had a gun turret on top too. Wow. It's pretty uh, inventive for that time in history. Hmm. Looks like they're about all the same color. General purpose for wax. I mean, I guess they were the only company that could probably make that many at the time because they had all the manufacturing prowess. Yeah. So the vehicle was later called the Jeep, became one of World War II's most iconic, iconic symbols. 36 Dodge Brothers. Boy, they got a ton of mini bikes in here. They got a ton of mini bikes in here. Look at that. Yeah. They were popular. This Dodge right here. I bet it got that 440 in the back. Super D. 440 out of your car. Good year, wing foot tires. Mm. Waltham Orient. What is that? It's a Waltham. Wonder if he's from Waltham, Massachusetts. Got him. Got him. Look, it even moves. I guess it, the wind blows, it moves? Or is it on a, a motor? We had a small change of plans. We were supposed to go into New York City today, but uh, we're, we called the, uh, the RV park there in Jersey City across from. Uh, Statue of Liberty just to get some information there and unfortunately They just want way too much money to park there. So we're gonna have to figure out something else And we're just on our way to Niagara. So we're driving through But we're on the Montgomery Pike and this is Bald Eagle Mountain. It's small in elevation compared to what we normally do But it's a thousand feet